Next, we're going to have uh, Lorenzo Miniero from... Uh, Mitico. Mitico. Thank you. Mitico. Thank you. Um, and he's going to be talking to us about troubleshooting and monitoring Janus. A epic journey. Only people that know about Homer get, Homer get that. Oh, I know everyone knows about Homer. Raise your hands if you know about Homer. Raise your hands if you want to be Homer. <laughs> This is another dating game. <laughs> this is my chest. Uh, okay, can you hear me just fine? Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And first of all, um, I, I know there has been some confusion about me and the other Lorenzo because there are too many Lorenzo in VoIP apparently. So just to settle this once and for all, I'm the Italian guy with the bird. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And this is not my first time here in, uh, in OpenSIPS, so I'm very glad to be here for the third time and very honored to do so. And, uh, and at OpenSIPS, uh, for the first time a couple of years ago, I introduced Janus for the first time. And there, is, there will be no time to actually talk about Janus itself if you're not very familiar with it. I'll just explain that it is ideally a general purpose web RPC server that is completely open source. Of course, there are links over there that you can go to for, for getting the code, uh, demos, documentation, whatever you want, or also join the community. And uh, the, there are also a, the links to, account, to the two presentations that I made before. before. Uh, a couple of years ago, I introduced Janus for the first time, then I explained last year different ways by which you can interact with CP infrastructures using Janus, how Janus can facilitate these for web RPC access and things like this. But uh, again, there will be not much time to explain actually what Janus is, just considering it, considering it a general purpose WebRTC component that allows you to do video conferencing, audio mixing, interaction with C, RTSP, whatever you want, basically. If, uh, assuming that there is the right module for it and you can also write your own, of course. The, the main purpose of this presentation is to explain how you can actually monitor and troubleshoot the Janus instance, actually, which is, of course, quite, uh, quite interesting for several different reasons. And historically, the, the way that we provided access to that was via what we call the admin API, which is basically a request-response protocol that allows you to, to ask information about specific connections, let's say, and Janus gives you back a snapshot of whatever is referred to that specific connection. So, the way by which it connected or it did it connect, uh, statistics and stuff like this. But of course, considering that it is request response, it's not really the, the best way to handle that. Most importantly, because as soon as that connection goes away for any reason, because the user goes away, for instance, you lose all that information. So it's not available anymore, meaning that you cannot troubleshoot things that, that went wrong for any reason. Which is why then we started working on another approach that is called event handlers instead, which is basically an asynchronous mechanism. So the typical way of generating events that then get uh, collected somewhere else so that they can be processed and so on. So both the core, the Janus core, and the, the several different plugins that we provide all generates events continuously and in real time, and then some, somewhat somebody else can take care of them by, I don't know, saving them to a database, sending them somewhere else, and so on. And funnily enough, it is an idea that actually was born uh, here two years ago. So I chatted with, uh, with Celeste, Lorenzo, Alexander, and so on about this, about how do we have Janus interact with Omer for the debugging of SIP applications. And we both came up with an idea that actually turned out to be this event enters in particular. And the way they work are actually quite simple. So we have uh, each of these event handlers is actually a separate model within Janus, which means that you can also write your own event handler if you want. And the, the idea is that Janus and the plugins just generate, generate events all the time. There is a dispatcher that is aware of all the modules that are subscribed to, to these events. And then each of these handlers receive a copy of this event. And then what these event handlers do is really up to the handlers themselves. So there may be one that shoots them out to an HTTP backend. There may be one that just saves to a database. There may be another that does something completely different. It's really up to what you really need and which event handlers you have available. And the first one that we wrote was really a very basic HTTP forwarder of these events. So basically, for each event that we collect, we just send them via HTTP to a HTTP backend that you can, can configure. There are some optimizations like grouping events, there are retransmissions in case the backend doesn't answer and so on. But apart from that, 
it's really that simple. It doesn't need, it doesn't do anything more than that. Which means that all the processing is not done by the event handler itself, but it's done by another component. So the event handler just shoots events outside, and then it's up to the recipient of the event to collect them, process them, do whatever they need to do with it. And uh, of course, there are other handlers available. I'm not going to go too much into detail about this, but uh, there are other handlers available. There are uh, some that are available as a pull request right now. Mozilla also write a cool uh, event handler for their own needs, which is based on SQLite. So they basically just collect all the events to an SQLite database so that they can then evaluate them later on using the integrated JSON support that SQLite provides. Of course, generating events is only one side of the coin, so one flip of the coin. The other side is, of course, what, what we, do we actually want to do with these events? Because, because, of course, what we want to do is collecting these events and then uh, analyze them, process them, and see what we can extract as an information for either uh, post-mortem proces post processing of the events to see what went wrong in a session that already ended, but even, let's say, to figure out if there is anything that we can detect in real time. So if there is anything that we can do to fix the session that is still going on, so that we are notified immediately, and so on. And of course, it's not an easy task. And most importantly, because as I was anticipating before, Janus is conceived to be a general purpose. So uh, there is a Janus core, and then there are different plugins that actually implement different application scenarios uh, as, as functionality, basically. And considering that, as I'll explain later, in a real use case, uh, a real Janus based application can actually combine multiple plugins of different types. This means that it becomes um, quite complicated sometimes to, to correlate all the different information that you have because the user may have multiple <laughs> media connections at the same time. It, these connections may be connected to different plugins at the same time, each providing their own application level information and so on. And so correlating all this information in something that makes sense and something that you can use to, to reconstruct some kind of <coughs> topology can be quite, quite of a challenge. And of course, to, to handle events, that are, there are different things you can, you can do. The simplest one is, let's say you're using the HTTP notifier that I was explaining before, you just create a web server that just dumps all these events to a file. So you have a sequential file of all the events, and as soon as something is done, you just have a look at these events and try to figure, 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 it out, figure, it out, figure them out by yourself. You can save them directly to a database using, for instance, the, the Mozilla event handler that I was introducing before. You can write your own handler or your own backend to handle all the events on your own the way that you want. Or, as I did, you can just trust the, trust the smart guys to do the, the right thing, which is basically uh, feeding all this information to, 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 to Qubsit for, let's say, uh, to Homer and Havik in order to have them analyze all the data and figure out what's wrong. And, of course, event handlers have been supported in Homer since day one, actually, which is not surprising because, I was, as I was saying, uh, uh, the idea was actually born here, talking to them about how the, this information might be of use to them. And, in fact, in Homer 5, you have native support for this. You can uh, recreate old charts about the zip call in particular about, uh, on, the, on the Janus side as well, so that you can reconstruct and follow uh, a media session that, uh, that was originated or terminated by Janus for, for this uh, for concern C. And in fact, we also introduced this together a, a year ago at FOSDEM. We were actually one after the other talking about pretty much the same thing, which is why Lorenzo came up with this nice wrestler-based uh, analogy over there. Unfortunately, I'm not that muscular anymore. So. And, uh, of course, at the time, in Homer 5, uh, the idea was mostly let's, let's figure out how we can get as much information as possible related to zip code, because that was the main aim and the main task behind Homer 5 at the time. And so the, the, the answers that we wanted to answer at the time were pretty much different. So I can extract zip messages from Sophia C, which information would be nice to have, and so on, how we can feed information to, to Homer, uh, and things like that. But, and this is nice, I mean, it still works fine. There are a lot of companies that are actually using this uh, in production right now, but there is a problem, that, a problem, let's say, in quotes, that it is, and it was SIP only. So it was only useful if you wanted to debug purely SIP-based applications, which is a bit of a constraint when we think about Janus in general, because as I was mentioning, there may be multiple connections involved at the same time that may involve multiple different sources at the same time. So not just SIP, it may involve other protocols, it may be a purely WebRTC-based video conference and so on. 
which means that there are other challenges that are involved. So how to address the correlation of different users, how to address the correlation of multiple streams belonging to the same users, how you can reconstruct the topology of a media session, and so on. All ch challenges that Lorenzo and I try to, to tackle together. And so, first of all, the first, uh, let's say, challenge, not really a challenge because it was already there, was how to get these events that were generated by Janus to Homer and Epic in the first place. And as I was saying, Homer 5 supported these out of the box via uh, headpipe.js, which basically acted as an event server of the HTTP uh, event generator that I was introducing before. So headpipe.js just receives, received all those events in real time, did some manipulation over those, and then injected these events in the platform so that they, they could be evaluated. Within, um, within Homer. As, as you've seen in the presentation yesterday, a lot of things have changed in the internals of Homer. Homer 7 now has several different backends that I can actually be used for, for the purpose. It has a different way of processing events in the first place. Uh, and Lorenz also introduced HEPOP and, and HEPLIFY as ways to actually inject events that actually come from different sources within uh, within the new Homer and Havoc. And this is exactly what we try to, to take advantage of. And the, the behavior is pretty much the similar. So you have Epop again acting as an event server, pretty much as Epop.js did. And by the way, Epop.js of course still works if you're just interested in, in, SIP, in SIP data. If you want to, to do more with Janus events, you're advised to use Epop instead. And basically, this uh, HEPOP acts as an event server, receives all those events, and according to the media type, to the event type, it can do different things with events. So, for instance, turn all the statistics, the real-time media statistics, into a time series that you can evaluate in real time and do processing on, and then save other information to the database or whatever needs to be done there. And oh, by the way, this also works with the media soup, the, the, the component that you just saw, because both genres and media soup are able to generate events in real time, and Homer and Havoc is conceived to, to handle both of those in a transparent way and handle them pretty much the same way. So all the concepts that I'm introducing today pretty much also apply to, to MediaSoup as well. And for now we are using the HTTP notifier that I introduced before, but one uh, ideal, let's say, improvement that we want to take care of in the future is to, to use a different protocol to pipe all these events from Janus to, uh, to Hepic, and one of the options might be MQTT, which is a much more lightweight and effective protocol for that, uh, because of course HTTP has an overhead attached to it that we'd rather avoid if possible. The second challenge is of course in how you store and then process all of these events, because as I mentioned, generating events is one thing, we also want to analyze them both post-mortem, ex-post, or live to figure out if there is anything that we can do with the data. And again, uh, Lorenzo explained how there are several different, uh, different options in Homer and Epic right now, so different ways of saving these events or processing them and, and so on, which is kind of exciting. But the, the most important uh, announcement for us was the ability to work on JSON objects themselves. And this is important because uh, in Janus, all the events are actually generated as, Jan as JSON objects, which means that if we can generate, uh, if we can pass these JSON objects as they are over there and then save them in Homer somehow, this means that we can also do queries directly on JSON itself which can be quite helpful if you have to, let's say, analyze the data, try and correlate information that is actually specified as part of the JSON objects, rather than different columns in a, in a, in a database row, for instance. And, of course, Homer and Epic now support JSON as a native format, which was quite helpful for us. And besides, the, the smart thing to do, which is exactly what they did, was to um, actually both store events and tag them as events flew by, which means that for each event that comes in according to the type, you can also extract from the JSON object some specific information that can be used to tag some specific events so that you can then work on these tags rather than the, all the overall events themselves in order to do searches, to do correlations about specific elements and so on, so that you know that all those events are related to a specific user without actually needing to look at the whole JSON object just for, for getting this specific information. And again, the media statistics themselves can be easily turned into a time series which as I'll explain later, can be quite useful also for monitoring and alerting things in real time, which could be a, a really nice improvement over, over what we have at the moment. Correlation is, of course, something that I was uh, particularly uh, interested in because, uh, again, Janus is really flexible. You can do a lot of things with it, but it can be a bit overwhelming at times to correlate all of this information coming from different sources. 
And so the first thing that we really wanted to do was being able to identify a specific user using Janus into a Janus-based application. And typically, when you talk to Janus directly from the browser, let's say if you are using the Janus API directly from the browser, you typically have a different session for each user, for each user which means that typically you just look at the session ID and you say, this is a user, I can, I can rely on this information. But there are actually use cases, and one specific use case that I'll go through later, where actually there are server-side applications that took the Janus API from the server side and then expose their own API on the client side instead. And in this case, it's not that, un then not that uncommon to have these server-side applications just use a single Janus session for all the users, actually. So all the users have different handles attached to them, but they all belong to the same conceptual session, which it's, it's a choice that can be made, and but this means that we cannot rely on the session anymore to identify users. We need to have something else in place, which is why we then introduce a new com a new attribute that is basically called the NOPAC identifier. So this is something that clients provide and can be whatever you want. It can be a no out key that you associate it with the user somehow. It can be the name of the user. It can be really whatever you want. Janus really doesn't care about it. It just passes it along as it is. But as long as a specific user always passes the same OPAC identifier in all the sessions, in all the, the connections it creates, we know on the server side that these belong to the same user in that specific session, basically. So this, is, this was actually quite useful in, uh, in, in figuring out the correlations about different uh, connections belonging to the same users in, in Janus-based applications. And this is not useful, useful only for intra-plugin correlations, of course, but also for inter-plugin correlations, because um, there are, let's say, some relations, but this may be easier to understand from, from this picture over here. And you can see this as pretty much as the presentations that Iñaki and Jose made before, where you have somebody contributing media in, let's say, uh, a video conference, and somebody else that is receiving this media from this publisher. So, it's obvious that these two are different connections, of course. There are different legs in a, in a call, if you want to look at it that way. And this means that if we notice that there is, let's say, severe packet loss on this channel over here, it may mean different things. It may mean that there are actually network issues on that specific connection, but it may also mean that actually the problem is at the source on the other side. So maybe that publisher is losing a lot of packets because he is on a bad network and so on. And this, of course, affects all the subscriptions to that same publisher session. And the only way by which we can actually understand that if we want to debug this, we also need to know about that specific con connection is to be able to, to figure out all the correlations that exist between all of these different connections that are, let's say, abstracted by the Janus score and the plugin. And this was an important thing to figure out because typically the Janus score knows nothing about what plugins do and vice versa. So the, for, for the Janus score, these are just two different WebRTC peer connections. It doesn't know who is feeding what, basically. This is all up to the, to the media plugins. And this is done on purpose because we want to give plugins complete freedom about what they want to do without constraining <coughs> them by what the Janus score does. And so this means that we have to trust plugins also to provide us with information about how to correlate these different sources together. And finally, we also wanted to, to tackle client-side events because all the events that I've been talking so far are events that Janus generates by itself. So it's statistics that Janus collects on from its own perspective. It's connectivity information that Janus collects on its own perspective instead. But of course, clients can also gather st statistics on their own, and specifically in WebRTC there, is, there are APIs, typically in JavaScript, but also in WebRTC libraries, that allow you to collect statistics also from the client side. And of course, having a perspective of both ends of a peer connection that, that would allow us to, let's say, double, double check and double cross some information as soon as we see something is wrong would be very helpful. And <coughs> what we wanted to do was making sure that we could get this same information via the same channels, basically. And so ideally, again, via Janus, even though this was not something that Janus generated, and again, via end handlers so that they could get to Homer and Epic eventually. And this is basically what we did via a new Janus plugin. So normally, the idea is that users uh, use all the plugins they need for video conferencing or for whatever they need, but they can also connect to this other plugin just for feeding this new statistics information. And so as long as they are using the right OPAC ID, as I was mentioning before, we know that these client-side statistics are associated to this user for a specific peer connection, for instance. 
And this way we can then pipe them to Homer and, and, and Hebig and they can evaluate and turn them into a different time series that can be correlated to the server side statistics as well. And this is currently work in progress. We have a working demo that uses RTC stats at the moment. It's not open source yet, but the idea is to make it available as soon as it is in an actually usable stage. And to conclude, I wanted to give you some information about the real use case, because of course right now I've only discussed things from a theoretical perspective, so how we actually approach the problem and try to figure out the different challenges that were in there and so on. And a very good use case actually came from ITF meetings, because uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, my company is uh, the, the, the provider, of, the official provider for remote participation at ITF meetings. So if you have ever attended the, uh, an ITF meeting remotely, you have used our software actually which uses WebRTC and uses Janus in the back end, of course. And you can see it's basically a, a web conferencing platform where all the events are streamed in real time, pretty much like this, but people can also chime in remotely and make questions and present and so on. And this was a particularly interesting use case because uh, in this case, we had three different plugins working at the same time for all users. We had Zip as the Zip plugin for audio because we use Asterisk for mixing all the audio streams. We use the broadcasting plugin to capture a static feed, like a camera like that one, or the video feed coming from the Beamer, and turn this into a WebRTC broadcast. And then the SFU plugin, the video room plugin, to allow people to present remotely, inject their own video, and make questions or present, and so on. And if you want to know more, there are a couple of presentations that I made last year about this. And more specifically, we collected information about uh, 10 different working group sessions uh, at the last ITF, specifically those in the last day of the event on Friday. Typically, during the ITF, there are about 140 different sessions taking place, so there are a lot of sessions that we need to follow, eight tracks in parallel. We just cho chose to focus on a small subset of those in order to have a test case study, but this already provided us with a good mix of sessions to have a look at. So, there were sessions that were longer, shorter. There were sessions with or without active speakers, several different users with different network conditions. I mean, this gave us a lot of interesting data to have a look at and figure out if we could extract any useful information for that. And before actually involving Homer and Etic for this, we wanted to first have a look at the data in a more raw way, so to figure out if there, there was all the information that we needed and if uh, there, were, there was something else that was needed and so on. And which is why uh, we started basically to just uh, get all the, we capture all the information to a file, as I was explaining before, and then we piped all that information into a Postgres database using the, the, the native JSON support, which allows us to, to make different queries on the, on, on the data set and so on, and see if there was anything that we could extract over there. And then we played a bit with different queries with all the data that was available to try and answer several different questions. So if we could reconstruct the topology, if we could figure out how many participants were, were in the room when they joined, when they left, uh, who was subscribed to what, who was an active participant during the session, and who was actually just attending the whole time, and so on and so forth, or maybe any network errors that occurred and stuff like that. And we use this information to then create the ugliest web pages that you can imagine, like this one. So let's say we could, for the M Music Working Group, there, this was the list of participants, and there was just a single active participant that made some questions uh, over there. Uh, for, a, for a specific participant, we could see all the preconnections that they created. So for instance, there were a different, uh, this user, uh, for instance, used the zip code to join the audio mix and then subscribe to some of the static feeds, then, as I mentioned, was also an active participant, so sometimes joined the, the video room to publish something. If we have a look, for instance, at the static slides uh, that he was subscribed to using that specific handle, we can drill down to, to those specific information instead, like connectivity information, how they were connected. In this case, they were using a few reflexive address over there. Uh, how their connection worked, whether ICE and DTLS succeeded and stuff like that. And also the ugliest charts you'll ever see as well. So try to get all the media statistics and then turn them into graphics somehow so that you could evaluate them. And you can immediately find out that there was something wrong with the graphics over there, which was actually a bug that we found out in, in the general specification. So we found out that there was something wrong in how we calculated the round of time which is effectively a, effectively a bug into, we lost precision in some of the calculations, and so it either was super high or super low. So this is something that we fixed, but we only managed to, to find out when we actually looked at the data that we were generating, something that we were not doing before. 
And more in general, of course, the most interesting part was getting all of this information then as soon as we found out that, that there were some, some things that we needed to change and stuff like this to, to fit this into Homer. And so you, here you can see some examples for a video call test uh, of events that are actually collected and represented using the Homer and Epic interface. And at the same time, how you can uh, reconstruct, let's say, a sequence diagram of all the components interacting with each other. In this case, not only network components, but also inner components, like a plugin talking to the channel score and stuff like that. But rather than just showing uh, screenshots and so on, it's probably just easier to, to, to delegate all of this to, to Lorenzo over there, because he will make a presentation on, on the new Homer and Epic tomorrow, and this will include some details about all of this as well. So, I encourage you to, to have a look at this, uh, this demo tomorrow to see, uh, to see all this in action. And just to conclude, uh, I hope I'm, I'm on time right now, this was really useful for us, not only in terms of the Homer and Epic interaction, but also to figure out things that we were doing wrong. So for instance, we also found out that there was some information that we were providing, but not in a user-friendly way. So maybe it was a single string that could instead be split in several different fields that could be directly searchable and so on, which is what we did for a few events. But of course, the, the most important integration uh, purpose of this was to figure out how uh, this could be used in an effective way, because of course, producing events is useless unless there is a consumer that can actually make use of those somehow. <coughs> and this is, of course, for us, was just the beginning of the, the journey. So the journey was the title I gave to this presentation and for, for a specific purpose. We definitely want to generalize all these considerations to other genres based applications. So in this case, we had a, a reasonable use case that involved multiple uh, different plugins, but we want to make this uh, let's say usable in also other kinds of different applications. We have collected some data for this and we'll use that in the future. But most importantly, I'm very interested in how live monitoring and troubleshooting can, can be used. And uh, of course, this is already part of Homer and Habit. Live alerting is already part of that using time series and so on. So this is really just a matter of figuring out if we are providing enough information for this to happen. And I guess this is all. I um, Thank you for the attention. Uh, I don't know if there's any time for questions. Uh, thank you, Lorenzo. So we still have uh, time for like one or two questions, if you have any in the audience. Okay, Swami. I, I was wondering if there is any plan about implementing some kind of a double ratchet uh, algorithm for encryption, like WhatsApp or uh, Signal or all of those encrypted uh, uh, messaging uh, projects especially with all of the talk about privacy in the last uh, couple of months and year. Uh, if there is a plan for going there. Like you mean just plain instant me encrypted instant messaging? You yeah, like with dual ratchet, like that uh, each one of the site can uh, decrypt the message, like uh, in, you encrypt it in the uh, most... Uh, uh, modern uh, chat. <laughs> yeah, there is nothing specific for instant messaging in particular, but there is something that is going on in the ITF specification for uh, privacy enhanced and conferencing actually. So in the ITF there is uh, an effort that is called PERC, B E R C, where they are basically trying to enforce some form of double encryption in media conferences. So uh, in Janus or even in MediaSoup, you've seen that there is an SFU based approach where there is a single, uh, let's say, a publisher and multiple subscribers. And of course, for this to work, this means that the encryption only works hop by hop. So you have the publisher sending media to channels or media soup in an encrypted way. This is decrypted for different reasons, because we need to manipulate the RTP headers and so on, and, or maybe because we need to record the streams and stuff like that, and then this is made available to all the other users. But this doesn't give you any guarantee about the actual source of the media, because in this case, the WebRTC server error acts as a man in the middle, specifically. So it's not really end-to-end -end encryption. And they are trying to fix this via this new effort that is called PERT by basically enforcing some kind of a double encryption via SRTP. I'm simplifying, of course, but this is the concept by which the, uh, there is still a, a hope by hope encryption <coughs> by, at a lower layer so that you are still able to, uh, I don't know, mess with RTP headers and stuff like this. But the actual media content is still encrypted and it still contains information about the actual source. So that when you receive the streams, you know that even if it bounced to an untrusted component, you still know that it came from Iñaki or from Marseille or someone else. So this is basically the concept. It might be generalized to also instant messaging and so on, but I'm not really sure they're going to do that because this is specific to SRTP at the moment. Thank you. Thank you.